We're going to look at Matthew 22, beginning in verse 23, and we're going to go to the end of the chapter. Three uh, kind of interesting stories, One, and it started with the story that I read. Jesus is in the temple area, and the Sadducees come up to Jesus, and they confront him with this question that we read about. What a, what a bizarre question. I mean, is it not a very a strange question? Question: Why would the fair, why would the, excuse me the Sadducees be asking that question? I'm going to flip over to Acts 23. You don't have to turn there unless unless you would like to to give you uh, some understanding of the Sadducees. The Apostle Paul in Acts 23 finds himself in the Sanhedrin, and they're accusing him of all kinds of things, most of which are true. You know, proclaiming Jesus is the only way for salvation. This is what it says on at Acts 23, beginning in verse six. Paul knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others Pharisees called out in the Sanhedrin. He says this, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I know you're as shocked as I am that religious people are fighting. I mean, it blows our minds. I'm kidding. I hope you understand I'm kidding. The Sadducees, this is what the Bible says. The the Sadducees in verse 8 say that there is no resurrection. There are neither angels nor spirits. Yet that's what the Sadducees believe according to Acts chapter 23 verse 8. The Sadducees, there is no resurrection. That there are neither angels nor spirits. But the Pharisees, on the other hand, acknowledge all of them. Verse 9, there was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. This is a pretty serious debate. This wasn't a polite conversation over coffee. The commander was actually afraid Paul would be killed by these people because they were in such sharp dispute over the supernatural. So understand the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection of the dead, do not believe in angels. In fact, they do not believe in spirits in general or what we might call the immaterial. And so these same Sadducees came up to Jesus and they don't believe in a resurrection. And what they're presenting to Jesus is not a a a genuine heartfelt desire to have their their minds and hearts illuminated to the truth of God. They're seeking to trap Jesus based on their preconceived notions. And so they say, listen, Moses said that if a, a man is married and he dies, his brothers have to seek to continue his family name by marrying his wife. And this was a, a practice in the Old Testament And so they're trying to trap him logically. Obviously, this means that in heaven, this woman would be in a polygamous marriage. And not only does that sound absurd to us and a little bit distasteful, it would have at that time as well. Do you you suppose that in heaven it's just a a community of polygamous marriages? I mean, that, that sounds a little bit bizarre, does it not? And that's exactly what they're intending to do. They're they're intending to present logic that says, if you believe in the resurrection, you believe in heaven, you will have multiple marriages. And Jesus gently corrects them. And by gently, I mean smacks them upside the head. You are in error because you do not know scriptures or the power of God. You, You are in error Because you do not know scriptures or the power of God. And here's what we're going to talk about just for a few minutes this morning. Is I want you to to look at the passage we're going to think about. And I want you to to do one thing. And so the title of the message is sort of a a statement of what you ought to do. If you like to-do list. Take God at his word. Take God at his word. And his first charge here to the Sadducees is they aren't taking God at his word. His word is quite clear on what life is like. There is going to be life forever. The only question is, are you going to be in God's presence or are you not going to be in God's presence? And, and the Sadducees are trying to trap Jesus and say, we can't take God at his word because it doesn't make any sense. It would result in heaven being a very bizarre place. And Jesus says, you're an error. You don't know the scripture, nor do you understand the power of God. 
Verse 31 of, of, excuse me, Matthew 22, read it again. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So Jesus is quoting from a story from a, a time in the life of Moses long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have died. And Jesus is saying, what God is saying is, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not back then, but right now because they're still alive. Moses is alive at the time that God said this to Moses. And he's saying, this is also true of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not because they're dead, but because they're now in my presence. Raised into my presence. The Sadducees would not have agreed with that, and Jesus is saying, you don't understand the Scripture. The Scripture says Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are in the presence of God, nor do you understand the power of God. Why is it unfathomable to you that God can keep people alive forever, that God can, in fact, raise the dead? So if we're going to take God at His word, I want to give you a very simple statement that is bizarre on its face. Are you ready? God raises the dead. I mean, is, is that the strangest thing you've heard today? Well, you've been to church. You've probably heard some stranger things. God raises the dead. What God's word and what God's testimony and God's power would demonstrate and what God would testify to us through his scripture and through what he has done in history is he, in fact, takes dead people and brings them back to life. What the Sadducees believed is God either doesn't do that or God can't do that. So if you're going to take God at His word, you must believe that God, in fact, can raise the dead. If you're going to believe that the Bible teaches God is who He says He is, you must understand that God raises the dead. But we don't always believe this. What do we believe? When we need God to raise the dead or heal the sick or provide what's needed... God is either absent or impotent. That is, God is either not present, that is, He doesn't care about what's going on in our life, or He is present, He just doesn't have the power to actually do anything. The assumption is that God gets trapped into the same circumstances we get trapped into, and His options are limited. And and so God certainly couldn't intervene in a supernatural and powerful and miraculous way. If God doesn't raise the dead and he is either absentee in my life or if God can't raise the dead, which means he is powerless, that means for God, for me, God is is really just a dispenser of good advice on how to live a wholesome life. If God is not powerful enough to raise the dead, he is nothing more than a dispenser of good advice on how to live a wholesome life. Who would worship that God? Well, most of our country. God is just simply the dispenser. This is how good people live. This is how good communities operate. This is how generous people live. This is how you live in good uh, neighborhoods. This is, you know what I'm saying? I mean, God would never actually intervene. So really all he is is a list of things that good people do. How to live a wholesome life. And if on balance you get your wholesome living outweighs your unwholesome living, God is probably going to bless you. And if God isn't blessing you, well, most likely it's because your unwholesome living is outweighing your wholesome living, right? Am I the only one that thinks that way? Apparently so. The hush over the room tells me I'm on my own on this one. If God is nothing more than a dispenser of good, of good advice on how to live a wholesome life, the fact is we don't know Scripture and we don't understand the power of God. God raises the dead. God takes dead people and makes them alive again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The entire chapter is about the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. And we don't have time this morning for me to read the entire thing. I'll challenge you sometime today to sit down and take maybe four or five minutes to read 1 Corinthians 15. But let me just point out a couple of verses to you. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 12. But if it is preached, and this is the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. The Apostle Paul would argue that if you believe that dead people can't come back to life, then even Jesus is still dead. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then even Christ has, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If Christ is not raised, if there is no resurrection from the dead, I can tell you one thing that's absolutely true. Right now, this very moment, you are wasting your time in this room. I have no idea why you're even here. There's a football game on. I mean, I'm dead serious. If Christ is not raised, if the dead are not raised, coming to a place like this, singing some songs, hearing somebody get up and yammer on about the Bible, what a, what a colossal waste of time. I mean, I, and you, well, I don't mean to say it too strong, it's just I'm sort of putting in different words what Paul is saying. That, that your entire Christian life is a colossal waste of time, effort, and energy if Christ is not raised or if there is not such a thing as resurrection from the dead. Verse 15, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead. More than that, not only is your life a waste of time in Christ if He is not raised, you're also a liar. It's getting, going from bad to, to worse, and you're wondering why you're here this morning. He said, I could have got this at home. Verse 17, 1 Corinthians 15, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, and those who have fallen asleep in Christ are in fact lost. Verse 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ. That is to say, if Jesus or God is nothing more than a dispenser of advice on how you can live wholesome, a uh, wholesome life, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. If Christ is crucified, and if the message of the gospel is only to give you a good life now, that is the most pitiful thing that could ever happen, according to Paul. In fact, he's saying we should be pitied above all else. Above all else, we should be pitied. The resurrection of the dead is critical for an understanding of the power of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do we believe in the resurrection of the dead? Yeah, okay, I think we'll agree. We're in church. We're supposed to say that. I agree. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. But, but it's a little bit tricky, isn't it? I mean, I've never seen anybody raised from the dead. Um, so try this. This will be a fun thing to do. When you go to Starbucks tomorrow, I know it's been, we just got done with Christmas, so everybody got Christmas gift cards, right? No? Well, I mean, we all did. It's great. So go to Starbucks and just tell them, hey, good morning. I believe dead people are raised. And they're going to say, yes, I've seen Sixth Sense too. It's a good movie. No, no, no. I actually think dead people come back to life. I mean, doesn't it sound strange? It sounds normal in here because we're in a church and there's big arches and, um, you know, there's, it's churchy. We, I mean, where else do you sit in benches like this? I know, the DMV. I just thought it's the DMV. It's the only other place. They, I'm kidding. That's terrible. It's funny because it's true. Um, but so, so to talk about the resurrection of the dead, I mean, in this room, and I'm being serious, it makes sense in here. This is where we talk about churchy things like people coming back to life. But go to Starbucks and tell them, I can't wait till I'm raised from the dead. It's going to be awesome. I mean, you, could you imagine the shock on their face? I mean, the chances are the person might be a Christian that might resonate with them. But, but this is what I'm saying is, is the Sadducees felt the way most of our culture does. To talk about people being raised from the dead is kind of kooky. People don't raise from the dead. You get sick and die, or you get old and die. Either way, there's only one, one thing that happens. You die at the end. And there isn't anything after that. It's just nothing else. You're, you're fertilizer. That's what the Sadducees thought. That's what our culture thinks. Read Ernest Hemingway. Most of his works are a description of life in the now. And look how it paid off for him. He took his own life because of his despair. We believe in the resurrection of dead, the dead. The question is not, is God near or is God powerful? Because God is near and God is powerful. The question is, do I trust him? Because we don't need for God, God does not need us to believe him for him to raise the dead. He's going to do it. 
The question is going to be, are we going to trust him that he is God who raises the dead, that he can intervene in the life of the individual to such a degree that he can raise the dead if needed. And this is what Jesus is wanting us to understand. To the degree that we don't trust God in his power and his presence to even raise the dead, we don't understand scripture and we don't understand the power of God. Take God at his word. Take God at his word. God raises the dead. I'm going to read the next section here. We need to continue moving along, otherwise I won't get all three points in, and that would be terrible. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, verse 39 then says, and the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commands. Take God at his word. Listen, take God at his word. Love of God is primary. Take God at his word. Love of God is primary. The Pharisees come and want to find out from him which law is the most important. This was a hotly debated topic for the Pharisees and religious leaders at the time. Which rule among the religious people is most important? What rule would you pick? I'd go with don't murder. That seems important, does it not? I mean, I'm, not, I'm being serious. Don't murder seems kind of important. I mean, if we could just get that one right, a lot of things would be fixed. How about don't commit adultery? That seems like a high one, Jesus. I don't want to be critical of his sort of religious answer, but don't commit adultery would solve a lot of problems in our culture, wouldn't it? Children, obey your parents. Amen. <laughs> I mean, I would believe a whole lot more in the Bible if children obeyed their parents. I would walk on up. God raises the dead. That's easy. Kids obeying their parents. Now we're talking miracles. And Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But Jesus, what if somebody uh, loves God and keeps doing bad things? I mean, you've really left the gate open for really bad things to happen in the religious community. There's, there's no control in the life of individuals, Jesus, if all we tell them to do is love God. How do we make sure that they're following their P's and Q's? How do we make sure that people are being good? How can we give them stern looks from the corner of our eye if all they have to do is love God? That seems a little willy-nilly. Take God at his word. Love of God is primary. What do we really believe, though? I mean, when it comes right down to it, we think God is primarily concerned with our behavior. When you pray to God and you talk to him about stuff, don't you really, in the back of your mind, are you really concerned about the stuff you did he didn't like? Your assumption is God is primarily concerned about your behavior. Our assumption is God is, is primarily concerned about the good things we didn't do and the bad things we did do. Oh, but we did do some good things, but we did them out of bad motives, so they don't even count. It's irritating. What do we believe? God is primarily concerned out of, about our behavior. When this is true about what we believe, when we don't take God at his word that he's primarily concerned about our love... He becomes nothing more than a hall monitor, primarily concerned with the smooth running of religious people's lives. Doesn't God as a hall monitor sound good? Do, do they even have hall monitors anymore? You know, don't run. Keep your voice down. No hitting. You know, somebody just stands there and just bark it. Don't do this. Don't do that. Stop doing that. Do that better. Don't you have to get to study hall? That, I mean, isn't that how we imagine God is in our Christian life? It's just... We're plotting through our life, and it's just God over and over again. What are you doing? Stop doing that. Why aren't you doing more of this? We don't take God at his word. And what Jesus said here, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Verse 40 says this, all the law, all of the prophets hang on the commandments of loving God and loving others. That means any effort we exert, any uh, any decisions we make or actions we take in terms of our relationship with God must flow from our affection for God. 
Anything we might do or not do in order to honor God in our life must flow from a love of God. Absence of our effort to live for God is just simply betraying a lack of affection. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This is what the Apostle Paul had to say to the churches of the area in Galatia. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I'd like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Let's answer that question. How do you receive the Spirit? Get saved. Trust Jesus and Christ alone for salvation from our sins because He died on the cross and He was raised three days later. When we put our trust in Christ for salvation, the Bible says we receive the Spirit. So the question is, did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing in what you heard? Which is it? It's believing. Good. I, I love it. We're, we're Orthodox Christians. It's amazing. Are you so foolish... After beginning with the Spirit, are you now going to attain your goal by human effort? Listen to what Paul says. You got saved by faith that the Spirit might do a work of salvation in your life, and now you want to live your Christian life by effort? That makes no sense. That makes no sense to the Apostle Paul. You, want to, you think to attain unto, to, to eternal life requires you to trust what Jesus did. And now that you've got Jesus, you're going to work your hiney off to live for him. And Paul says, what are you thinking? In fact, he says it this way. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? The law gains nothing. Everything we might have in Christ, both conversion and our walk with him, is accomplished by faith. Take him at his word. Take him at his word. The love of God is primary. And one of the problems with working ourselves to death to be really good Christians is we learn over time because of the frustration that causes to disdain God. Who would saddle me with this kind of obligation? Who would do this to me? And so we learn over time out of a life of obligation to not like God very much. And Jesus is trying to communicate to us, take me at my word. Just learn to love me more. And your effort for me in your Christian life will flow from your affection for me in your Christian life. Take God at his word. The love of God is primary. Read with me verse 41 through 46 of Matthew 22. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The Pharisees responded to Jesus, the son of David. This was true. The Pharisees at the time, of course, you don't need me to tell you the Bible is true. But the Pharisees at the time believed that the Messiah would come from the line of David. That the Messiah would come as a ruler from David's lineage, a king who would finally restore the fortunes of Israel. Jesus then said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? And Jesus quotes from Psalm 110, the most often quoted scripture from the Old Testament in the New Testament. David wrote these words in Psalm 110. You can look up the whole psalm later broadly considered to be a psalm about the coming of the Messiah. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you say that the Messiah will be the son of David, which means he will be a human, and in their minds a political leader who is akin to, like David, just some guy. So why would David be referring to the Messiah who would come from him as Lord? What does that mean to you if David is referring to his son who will come into the future as Lord? If David calls him Lord, Jesus says in verse 45, how can he be his son? How could, how could the Lord be the son of David? How is that even possible. Take God at his word. God is born a man. 
Take God at his word. God is born a man. There was no category for this for the Pharisees. There was no category for this for the Jewish people at the time. There was no category for this. They, they knew the Messiah would come from David. And so how would David have a son who would be referred to as Lord? Well, the, the reality is, what we believe is that God is limited by the realities of life. And it's impossible for God to be born a man, right? I mean, if, if you were asked, can God be born a man? Well, of course, we just celebrated Christmas. We all know the answer to that. But, but on the face of it, how could God be born a man? That makes no sense. He's going to be a son of David. He won't be God. He'll just be a guy whose family tree can be traced back to David. So, so we take Jesus is challenging them, take me at my word, God can be born a man. And they're saying, no, 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 God is limited by the realities of life. God is not human, and humans are not God. And Jesus would say, oh, Really? I'm not limited by your understanding of how the world works. What if, let's just say, for example here, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and placed in her body me, Jesus is saying, and I am in fact God. I have existed for all of eternity. In fact, I created all of the world. We'll find out in the book of Colossians from the Apostle Paul that Jesus is creator of the world, and he's sustainer of the world. Why does the moon not suddenly get sucked into the planet Earth? Because Jesus makes sure they keep their distance. Creator and sustainer. If I was Jesus at that time, I would say, don't make me mad. I can drop some moon on you. <laughs> he didn't do that. He's more mature than I'll ever be. So God is not limited by the realities of life. They're saying, it's not possible. If, if the Messiah is human, he can't be God. And Jesus is saying, I'm not constrained by how you view the world and how it works. If God wants to be human, he can be. In fact, he did. Jesus is saying, the son of David will, in fact, become God. If God is limited by the realities of life, God's ability to intervene in life will always be limited by how the world works. You know what God becomes if he's limited by the realities of life? God becomes a maintenance man with only temporary fixes. For example, a guy named Lazarus found himself in a grave for four days. And he has a life verse that we all quote often. Open the tomb, Jesus says. And what do they say? But Lord, it's been four days and he stinketh. The King James is the only way to quote that verse. <laughs> and so Lazarus is raised from the dead. We have no further commentary on his odor. What happens to Lazarus? Lives a few more years, has some good years, probably some interesting stories. Tell the story, Lazarus, about how you stunk. And then what happens to him? He dies. Jesus heals lepers all over Israel. Doesn't heal all of them, heals many lepers all over Israel. What happens to all of these lepers, every single one? They're all dead. What about the woman with the issue of blood? She's dead. What about all of his apostles? They're all dead. As one religious commentator said, 100 of all of 100 of 100 kale eaters die. <laughs> that and what's interesting is that's the only thing some of you're going to take from this message. I've talked up here for like 30 minutes. You're going to see you're going to go home and your wife's going to make you a kale salad. You're like, no, it's not going to help. <laughs> That's on you, not on me, buddy. God is not limited to the realities of life. He is not simply a maintenance man with temporary fixes to sort of make this life manageable. God comes as the son of David and as the son of God that our life might be instead of temporary and known only for what we exist here, but maybe e eternal and in his presence. And that changes our outlook on life completely. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Paul says this about his relationship with the Philippian believers. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul is writing from a prison cell, and he's saying, if my entire life is poured out like a, a cup of wine at the altar, so that there's nothing left, the cup is empty, and my entire life is poured out simply for the service of your faith, it's okay. 
it's okay. Because I have an eternal life with God that I am holding to. Because the only way he could have hope that his life would matter when it's poured out like a drink offering, when there is nothing left for his own regard, nothing left for him to enjoy, the only way you can have hope in that instance is if God was born a man, and if God is a man, and there is eternal life with him forever. Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. This is a verse many of you committed to memory. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's what it sounds like, and that's what it looks like to say God was born a man. And because of his work as a man on the cross, and because of the power of the God, power of God to raise him from the dead, I look forward to a life of eternity with God. And so my life here is forfeit, and it's not a big deal. I don't need temporary fixes because I have a permanent, eternal fix that lasts forever. Who is Jesus? Jesus is making a claim here, boldly in the temple, saying, I am God. Jesus is making a claim in front of the Sadducees, in front of the Pharisees, and all who would listen, is I am God. I came here to suffer your suffering with you. I came here to make my Father known to you. And what is that Father like? What is the Father like when Jesus comes and makes this proclamation to us? He is a God who sends a Son to make a way for us to be with Him forever. That's a good Father. That should gin up in you some affection for Him. He is not a hall monitor watching your P's and Q's. He is a Father who sends a Son to die on your behalf that you might enjoy His presence forever. Jesus would say it this way, and I don't mean to minimize the challenges that you and I face in the realities of life, but Jesus is saying it this way, there are bigger issues than the realities of our life. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 8, when we get to the glories of heaven, the challenges and suffering of this life will seem small. And Jesus is saying here, God is born a man so that the realities of your life might become insignificant and you might hitch your wagon to the Savior who will take us to glory. Take God at his word. God was born a man. He was born a man. Why is it difficult to trust God and take him at his word? We've said, I mean, these are very basic things. I, I plowed no new theological ground for you. Take God at his word. He raises the dead. Uh, take God at his word. Love of God is primary. Take God at his word. God is born a man in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and why is it difficult to trust God and take him at his word? And James tells us why. What causes quarrels among you? Do you remember the verse? Uh, no, it's not a fun verse. We try not to memorize it on purpose. What causes fights and quarrels among you, James says to the church. Uh, and he says this, it's your hearts. You are filled with envy. You are filled with greed. You want, but you cannot have. Why is it difficult to take God at his word? Because what he is offering, eternal life, love of God forever, salvation through Christ alone who came as a man to die on the cross and was raised for us, what he is offering for us oftentimes is not what our heart desires. If God doesn't raise the dead, then I have to acknowledge that this life is all there is. And when I feel like this life is all there is, I have to make it mean something. It has to be meaning in my job, meaning in my family, meaning in my kids, meaning in my marriage. And if God doesn't raise the dead, then then this life is all there is, and it oftentimes feels that way. And it's difficult to trust God and take it as, at his word. If God isn't concerned primarily about loving him first, then religion and, and understanding religion in the world is just a matter of balancing good with evil, trying to be better than I, than I am bad. And if God, if we don't take God at his word, then Jesus is just a, a guy that we should exemplify. What would Jesus do? He's just a really good example for us. 
And so what we can do is if, if God isn't who he says he is, and if, if God's word is not what he is really kind of saying here, then actually my life in God is kind of manageable. All I have to do is sort of have God and then have a life that has some meaning to it and sort of have God and, and on balance do more good than evil and, and sort of have God and do most of the things Jesus would do. And, that, and I, could, I could say, hey, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm a good Christian. But if God's word is true and God is who he says he is, then what happens? We have to testify like Paul, my life is poured out like a drink offering. That's an, there's another way of saying it. My life is forfeit. Because my, my love of God is such that my, I, I hold to, my, to this life loosely. I don't need it so much. Now, see, that's not manageable. For me to go to God and say, you can, God, do whatever you want. Whoa, whoa, simmer down, God. You can do whatever you want in this area of my life. Like, for example, obedient kid thing. I'd like you to do your thing on that. Just knock it out of the park on making my kids obedient. Love my wife as Christ loved the church, meaning gave up his life for the church, meaning my wife always gets her way forever no matter what. Now, God, let's temper that a little bit. Let's kind of make that love my wife in a similar manner, meaning I love her to the same degree that she loves me back. I mean, that's how it works. That's real world. I can love her, and when she loves me back, it's like, you know, give and take. And God says, no, no, that's not how marriage works in the Bible. You serve your spouse forever no matter what. Well, what if they don't love me? Boy, that sounds like Christ loving the church. So you've got a Christ-like marriage. If you have a wife or a husband who doesn't love you, boy, this is nice, isn't it? <laughs> but it's true. If I take God at his word and I really believe, does he raise the dead? If I really believe that love of God is primary and not if, whether or not I'm a goody two-shoes, if I really believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, then I will gladly say, pour out my life as a drink offering. See, a fellowship offering, you take part of it to the altar and it's sacrificed and you get to take part home and eat it. A drink offering, what happens when you're done with it? Cup is empty. You get to drink none of it. It's all for the altar. If it's true, then we gladly say, out of affection for God, my life is forfeit. And like Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord. Now, you think when you give up your life, you will be depressed and you won't get anything you want, but that's where we have to take God at his word. More joy is found in giving up my life and finding God than just having my little life. If it's true, God in your life is not manageable. God in your life will not do the expected. God in your life will not be reasonable. He will do the unexpected. He will ask of you the unreasonable because he raises the dead. If God only did the manageable or the expected or the reasonable, that's not a God worth worshiping. But a God who will invade your life and do the unexpected and the unreasonable, that is a God that is glorified. Take God at his word. And maybe for this year, I'm not going to ask you to do anything good. Isn't that nice? Besides, give money for the renovation of the worship center. <laughs> How about this? Let's start the year with this. Let's trust him. Let's rest in God. Let's allow our affections for a God who would send his son be so lifted that our life might be willingly poured out as a drink offering for him. Let's trust him. And why is that? Because all of eternity with God awaits us. All of eternity with God awaits us. So let's rest in him. And take him at his word. Will you stand with me as we close in prayer and sing one last worship chorus? I'm going to just give you a minute here before I close in prayer. I'm just going to ask you to come before God and ask him to ask you. I should say that correctly. Ask him to help you trust him. To rest in him. Jesus did it all. We can rest in him. And may our affections be lifted to him. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you came here as a man. How you suffered and died on the cross to pay for our sin. And because of your power, you raised from the dead three days later. But God, we confess that we don't always take you at your word. Our, our faith wavers and goes up and down. And God, we ask you 
strengthen our faith, allow us to trust you, to take you at your word that you raised the dead, to take you at your word that your primary concern is our love and affection for you, and to take you at your word that Jesus is God and he came here to save us. We take a minute right now where you stand and pray, seeking God's help that you might trust him more and allow him to invade your life in his unmanageable and unexpected ways.